Our next speaker is uh, Max Yadeberg from uh, Google DeepMind. And somebody earlier expressed already worries about that we don't have any deep learning in this workshop. So I think we're going to make people happy now, <coughs> potentially. We are going to make people happy. This deep learning. Very good. <laughs> um, and not much theory. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Max Yadeberg, and this is work that um, is going to be published next week at iClear, and it's on unsupervised learning for RL. And it's done with a bunch of colleagues um, at DeepMind, um, namely Vlad and Wojciech and Koray. Um, and so really, the motivation for this work comes from the fact that at DeepMind, we absolutely love deep reinforcement learning, obviously, and it's enabled us to do really cool things like get superhuman performance on Atari and um, you know, beat Lisa Dole last year at AlphaGo, um, with AlphaGo. And also, we have like really cool applications like cooling down Google's data centers and other things like that. And while on some domains, some restricted domains, it's very, you can design data-efficient reinforcement learning algorithms. Um, our more general reinforcement learning algorithms, um, such as DQN or Advantage Actor Critic, A3C or DPG, these more general um, deep RL algorithms are really, really data hungry. Um, and they learn very slowly and take a lot of data to actually work well. And why is this? Well, first of all, you know, there's a classic problem in RL where we have yeah, RL with complex domains, we might have very, very sparse rewards, so it takes a long, long time to uh, take a random walk through the environment and actually pick up that first reward. And so, and then once you get that reward, you only get a very small scalar signal, this return, which you're going to train from. And with this return, you make some sort of high variance or biased gradient estimate, and what you do with that high variance or biased gradient estimate is then and push that through a deep neural network which has you know, a million parameters, millions of parameters, and try and update the weights. And then you update the weights with stochastic gradient descent, which takes these small incremental, um, makes these small incremental changes, and you have to use a, a low enough learning rate so all of this variance and bias and these small changes don't actually explode your model and make things unstable. So all of, the, all of these things add up together to make um, really data inefficient algorithms. And what we, what, we, what we really want to do is get better at using the data that we have. And the key idea for this work is to augment the RL process um, with auxiliary prediction and auxiliary control tasks. Um, so to do basically unsupervised um, RL tasks on top of the base RL algorithm. And why this is cool is that um, these unsupervised tasks just add more training signal and extra supervision for free from your environment. And this gives you something, in the absence of true environment reward, it gives you something to train your feature extractors from. It gives you something to train the net parameters of your network from. Um, and this means that when your policy does stumble upon um, a true environment reward, you've got some good features to actually bind to that reward and start learning a good policy from. Um, and the result of putting these unsupervised tasks, tasks in is you, you, get, you can get a 10 times improvement in data efficiency. Um, and not only do you get faster learning, but you actually end up finding better policies and you get like a 60% improvement on final scores over vanilla A3C um, on our 3D environments, which I'll show a bit more of later. Um, so this is the... This is the general overview of the agent. The agent is called the Unreal Agent, because you need a cool acronym. It stands for Unsupervised Reinforcement and Auxiliary Learning. And um, the Unreal Agent augments a standard LSTM A3C agent, where A3C is Asynchronous Advantage Act Critic. And so you augment this um, base agent with three auxiliary tasks. And these tasks are pixel control, uh, value function replay, and reward prediction. And um, 
These tasks are learned in parallel with the base policy um, and everything is optimized together. And wh what's really important to note is that while in this work we used um, A3C as the base policy, there's no reason why you can't use these auxiliary tasks on top of any base RL algorithm like DQN or DTPG or TRPO. Um, and in practice we found it works fine for them. Okay, so that's an overview. Um, the first thing to look at is this base policy. And so for this we use um, an LSTM and this LSTM is trained with A3C as of before, so this agent takes in pixel observations. This is the first person pixel observations, or if you're playing Atari, you see the game. Um, taking pixel observations, you have a convolutional neural network which encodes these observations. These encodings are fed into an LSTM, um, and then the output of the LSTM is used, um, there's a linear mapping to a policy and a linear mapping to a value function. So the LSTM features are used for both the policy and the critic, the value function. And then this is trained with n step um, returns. So in practice, what we do is we unroll this LSTM agent for 20 steps in the environment. Um, and we compute a discounted return from the empirical rewards in that unroll. And we bootstrap with the value function predicted by the agent at the end of that unroll. Um, and then this is used to compose the advantage, um, which is then um, pushed through uh, the policy gradient and backdropped three times through the agent. And we update the parameters with RMS prop. And the asynchronous part of this algorithm comes from the fact that we don't just have one LSTM acting in the environment, it's one agent acting in the environment. We actually have a whole set of workers, in practice 16 or 32 workers, which are acting in, the, acting in multiple copies of the environment, all asynchronously, and all share the same weights and update and are updating the same set of weights. So the really nice thing about having these multiple asynchronous workers is that um, you can greatly overcome this high variance issue of uh, the issue of having high variance gradients. So it acts like a virtual batch um, if you think about mini batch learning and supervised learning. Um, so yeah, so that's the base policy, and the key point of Unreal is that we. We, we learn lots and lots of different policies, as I've shown in a bit, but we always act in the environment with the base A3C policy. So we're going to learn hundreds of other policies, but we only have actually take steps in the environment with actions drawn from our base A3C policy. Um, and then as the LCM agent acts, we're going to store all of these transitions in a replay buffer. So this is a small replay buffer of maybe 2,000, 4,000 of the most recent frames. And you saw the observations, actions, and rewards, or anything else you might need for your auxiliary tasks. And yeah, wh why we want this replay buffer is that we now have like a very small data set of some recent experiment, uh, recent experience that we can use to sample from, and we can start doing unsupervised learning from. Um, and so we sample transitions from this replay, and we can then do these off-policy tasks for feature learning only. And the reason that we want to do feature learning as opposed to, say, um, trying to use this recent experience for directly training our policy is that this experience is slightly stale, and so we can't naively just use it to train the policy directly. We'd have to do some sort of off-policy correction. And there are algorithms like uh, Retrace which will help you overcome the biasness of this stale data. But if we're doing feature learning, we don't even have to worry about that. We can just start training our convolutional network from this past data and not worry about how we're biasing the policy, that, that we're going to bias the policy directly. Um, and the key point of all these auxiliary tasks are that they share some components structurally in their networks with the components of the agents. So, um, all of these tasks use the convolutional network and some of them use the LSTM that the agent uses itself. So any training on the auxiliary tasks means that you're shaping the features for the actual agent acting in the world. Uh, okay, so the first auxiliary task um, is looking at defining lots and lots of different control tasks. So the idea here is to augment A3C with many auxiliary control tasks which allow you to learn about how to control different things in your environment. Um, and the idea is that if you're able to 
learn how to control this arbitrary stuff in your environment, then when it comes to actually trying to maximize true reward, you're already able to control everything you need to in your environment, so you'll be, you'll be very able to control the things you need to do, the, the, the things you need in your environment to get true reward. Um, so it'd be a really cool thing if we could learn to control different aspects of an environment. Um, in practice, sort of our first attempt at this is to do uh, pixel control and feature control. So pixel control is where we're trying to learn to maximally change parts of the visual input. So we're going to say, okay, the things that we can measure change in, in the environment are the actual pixels, so we're going to try and control uh, the intensity of these pixels. And then there's also feature control, where now we're learning to control the internal representations of the agent itself. So if we, if we think that the agent with its convolutional stack is extracting some interesting features from the environment, such as like uh, if there's um, a corridor or a juicy apple or something like that, then by controlling these internal features of the agent, we're actually like trying to find these interesting semantic objects. Um, the, the bulk of this work focuses on pixel control, because this is the easier thing and as much uh, and, and performs really well. Um, but I'll show I'll come back to feature control later on. So pixel control, as I said before, is to learn to maximally change parts of the visual input. And um, the way we do this is that you take you take the um, observation and here here drawn here is we, we divide it into cells, and drawn here is divided into nine cells. Um, in practice, we divide this into a 20 by 20 grid. So you take this observation, draw a 20 by 20 grid on it, so that gives you 400 cells. And what we're going to do is we're going to learn a per cell Q function, so a per cell policy, so 400 different policies, um, where the reward of this policy, uh, the reward of each of these policies is to um, is the absolute change in average pixel intensity in the cell between time steps. So we've got these 400 different cells. We're trying to we're, we're training policies, which are trying to take actions to basically switch these the intensity of these pixels in these cells on and off. Um, and we can train this huge number of policies really, really efficiently by um, exploiting the spatial structure. Um, of the of the space of cells, so we can use a deconvolutional net, which hangs off the LSTM of the agent, and produces these 400 policies, 400 <coughs> functions, um, and we can train this, uh, and we also use the dueling style architecture from Zhu Wang, and we can train this with um, n-step queue learning, and this is done off policy, and we we train these policies, but as I said, we never act with these policies. These are just to do feature learning. Um, and so you can imagine that if we are able to actually um, train optimal policies to learn how to control the, the visual stimuli, we're actually learning um, the, the, the underlying 3D structure of the, of the environment and how our actions change our behavior within that environment. Um, the second auxiliary task is an auxiliary prediction task. And here the idea is to focus the agent on learning what constitutes a rewarding event. Um, so this task is called reward prediction and very simply it's learning to classify whether in the next step you're going to get a reward or not. And um, one of the key things is that because this is done off policy and this is done just for feature learning, we're not actually trying to train a policy of this, we're, from this. We're free to skew the um, data distribution that we use to train this task in any way we want. And so, whereas in the real, in the real environment, the agent might encounter, um, might encounter rewards very, very infrequently and scarcely, when we store that in a replay buffer, we can then resample this experience, biasing the experience towards rewarding events. So in actual fact, we can sample little sequences um, from replay buffer with a 50% probability that the sequence is going to end in reward and 50% probability that it won't. So your agent ends up seeing rewarding experience much, much more frequently than it ever would um, from the natural data distribution of the environment. Um, so what we do is we sample these mini sequences. These are like three, three step sequences. Um, and each frame is encoded by the agent CNN 
And those encodings are concatenated and used by a small MLP to classify whether in the next time step, the next unseen time step, the, the underlying agent would have picked up a positive zero or negative reward. Um, and so by simplifying this task, this reward prediction task into a three class classification problem, and by doing this skewed sampling, so um, we're, we're going to do class balancing, um, this means that the agent's convolutional net, which is um, trained to do these encodings, uh, this convolutional net is trained very, very quickly and efficiently to detect the onset of rewarding states. Um, yeah. And then the final auxiliary task is value function replay. Um, this is a really simple idea, and that's just to reuse the experience in the uh, replay buffer to faster train the value function. Um, and obviously, if you have a better value function, you have a better critic, and you can get better estimates for your policy gradient. Um, and so yeah, we just sample sequences from replay buffer, perform map value regression, and many, many Extra iterations of this help promote value iteration and having a better critic, and also to train features which really predict long-term rewards in the future. Okay, so then you put these three auxiliary tasks together with the base A3C policy, and you get the Unreal Agent. And now the game is that we want to optimize all these four objectives simultaneously, and this starts to feel like multitask learning, which can be a bit of a pain because you have to start balancing the relative weights of all of these different tasks. Um, and so here you can see the overall Unreal loss function is composed of the A3C loss with some weighting on the value function replay and some weighting on the pixel control task and some weighting on the reward prediction task loss. Um, wh what we found quite surprisingly is actually this whole process requires really minimal tuning of this task balancing. And actually, in practice, we just set the weights of value function replay and reward prediction to 1 and a weight of 0 0.1 on the pixel control because pixel control is optimizing hundreds of policies. You just need to downweight it a little bit. But it's very, very robust to the, the weighting of these, um, these different tasks. So it seems that, that like they're all complementary and they, none of them actually hurts the learning of the underlying policy. Okay, so now I'm going to show you some experiments. Um, the first set of experiments was done on this 3D environment that we have called DeepMind Lab. Um, this is an open source environment which you can find on GitHub, and it's a 3D environment composed of lots of different levels. And all of the levels are um, designed by game designers to sort of expose different um, different challenges to the agent. And what I'm going to show now is a video of the, un of the trained Unreal agent in these environments. Um, so here the agent has to pick up apples, which give you plus one reward, and avoid the lemons, which give you minus one reward. So this is a really easy task. Um, here the agent has to go through a minus one lemon to get up the stairs to reach this juicy plus, one, uh, plus ten melon. So these are randomly sampled and procedurally generated mazes where the agent has to navigate through the maze in a time period and get to that, those orange cones. Once you get to the orange cone, you, you get a reward and you respawn. You have to find the cone again as quickly as possible. So there's three different sizes of maze. Um, this is the largest maze, which is really, really challenging for humans. And we also have these laser tag levels where we have the inbuilt uh, AI um, to provide opponents where you tag these guys with gadgets. Um, here's some more quantitative results. So we tested on a suite of 13 different games um, from DeepMind Lab. Um, the, some of the laser tag levels, the procedural mazes, and apple foraging tasks. And um, oh, the resolution is really bad. But, um, Okay, so on the left is the, are the learning curves which are normalized by human performance. So we have in-house expert games testers um, which set these human benchmarks. So here we're normalizing by human performance. So 100% would be 100% of human performance. And these, these are the normalized human performance as you train over 250 million uh, steps. And um, this is the average performance over the top three seeds 
averaged over all of the 13 levels. So the black curve is A3C, and you can see that it does okay, and you get a sort of 54% human performance by the end of training. Um, and the blue curve is unreal, um, which does really well. And the intermediate curves are when you add different um, combinations of these auxiliary tasks. So going from the black curve A3C, if you go to the red curve, which is the one above it, this is when you're adding the value function replay. So value function replay improves performance a little bit. Um, the green curve is when you have A3C with this reward prediction task. So you can see reward prediction really, first of all, speeds up um, training by a huge amount and also gets you much better performance. The pink curve is when you have reward prediction with value function replay. So you can see that they both help um, and you get better performance. The yellow curve is when you have A3C and you just add on this pixel control task. So you're training these extra 400 policies on top of A3C. And that gives a huge boost. Um, you're getting massive increases in speed. And then adding all of these tasks together obviously works the best, and that gives you the Unreal Agent. Um, and that gives you like a 10 times improvement in data efficiency. So 10 times uh, improvement in data efficiency. The agent is roughly 75% of the speed of the base A3C agent, so you don't get quite get 10 times increase in wall clock time, but it's, it's very close. Um, and you actually get a huge improvement in final performance, a 60% improvement in final performance. And what's also really interesting is that adding these auxiliary tasks gives you a lot more robustness to the learning process, and so it gives you more robustness to hyperparameters. So on the right-hand side is a robustness plot. So here, for these experiments, you launch a collection of experiments, and this shows the final performance. Um, and, and each experiment in this collection of experiments has a differently randomly, different randomly sampled hyperparameter um, over the space of hyperparameters. And this curve is sorting the final performance from all of these experiments by final score um, and plotting that. So a perfectly robust method, a method which was perfectly robust to hyperparameters, would be just a straight line on this curve. And you can see, you know, we're far from that, but if you compare, for example, the black line from A3C, um, there's like this region in the right of the curve where there are some, there are some hyperparameters which don't give you any learning at all, really. Um, whereas the A3C blue curve is a lot more up and to the right, and so we're a lot more robust to hyperparameters, and this means that we can uh, really reduce the computational budget required to get good performance on these levels because you suddenly don't have to search uh, across many hyperparameters anymore. Um, here's a breakdown of performance with the 13 different levels, and you can see that uh, it hasn't come out very well, but there are some games, for example, where you get like a 19 times increase in speed, and these are um, the, the ones which have actually the most dramatic effect are these uh, maze navigation levels, where it seems that adding this pixel control task really, really greatly increases the speed of learning, and it seems something about um, being able to understand the 3D geometry of the maze very early on in training, which is what these pixel control tasks end up doing, as I've shown a bit, um, really helps like actually train a policy to do well. Um, and so then, you know, the question you can ask is, well, do we actually need to do pixel control? Do we need to do full-blown control? Or is it enough just to do some like, e input reconstruction or maybe just input prediction? And so these experiments were done on two of the random maze levels. Um, the black curve is A3C by itself, and then uh, the green curve, which is just above it, is when you do input reconstruction. So this is basically having an auxiliary task of an uh, autoencoder as part of your network. And you can see the autoencoder can actually sometimes help early on in training, but very, very often it actually harms the policy as training continues. Um, so it's really not it's really not helpful at the end of training and can actually harm the policy. Um, if we do input change prediction rather than input reconstruction, that's the blue curve and that always, that always seems to help quite nicely. Um, but what's really interesting is by adding the control task on top of this change prediction uh, is the yellow curve and that always helps um, and is always the best performing model. Uh, so 
There's definitely something about actually understanding the effect of your actions in the environment, which gives you that extra boost in performance. And then this is coming back to the feature control idea. Um, feature control, you're trying to control the internal agent features which are changing underneath you. So obviously this is quite a hard optimization problem um, and it's tricky to get to work, but we can actually get it to work as well as pixel control. Um, so here, the uh, yellow curve is pixel control and the orange curve is uh, feature control. And here the feature control is the agent, is, these auxiliary policies are trying to maximize the activation of the output of the convolutional network of the agent. So the output of the last convolutional layer of the, of the agent's network has these activations, and you're learning a per activation policy which is trying to maximize these signals. Um, and so this works, and I think this could be a really, really interesting future direction. Um, because now, you know, the meaning of these activations could have um, yeah, quite interesting effects. And so this is a visualization of um, the agent itself playing. This is in one of the random mazes. On the left is the, the agent playing. Um, these are the observations it gets. And that sort of right column is the convolutional stack and the activations of the convolutional net neural network, with the circle being the LSTM um, and the activations of the LSTM. And then you can see the output of the agent being the value function, the blue trace, and the actions um, that are being sampled. And I think the most interesting thing is on the right-hand side, where you can see the auxiliary tasks, and in particular, the pixel control task. Um, so what this is showing is, this is showing the observation, and you can take the, the Q value, um, all, the, all the different Q values that the agent is predicting for these uh, 400 grid cells, uh, for, for one, 400 cells on the observation, and you can basically highlight areas of the observation which have high um, Q value. And so you can see what the agent thinks is the most controllable part of the observation. And quite rightly, the agent has learned that really the most controllable parts of the observation are these the edges of the corridors of the environment. And um, although it's going fast, it actually can understand which of its actions will change the edges of the corridors in which way. So the agent really has understand, understood something about its interaction with the environment um, through these auxiliary control tasks. Um, and then we can also run these experiments on Atari. Um, here we just applied the same algorithm with the same hyperparameters on the suite of 57 Atari games, and we get state-of-the-art performance with an 880% mean and 250% median of human normalized performance. Um, and there are some levels like Montezuma's Revenge. This is one of the hardest levels. Um, here, A3C is the black curve. And by the black curve, I just mean like the thick black line at zero the entire way. Um, so A3C does nothing here. And just by adding these auxiliary control tasks and um, prediction tasks, you can actually get learning on this really hard level. And this is, this is a level where you get very, very sparse reward. You need hundreds of steps to even find your first plus one. And it's a whole chain of events to actually get anything going. Um, and here's another learning curve, but this is on back on Labyrinth on the 3D um, maze. So again, the black curve is A3C, and the blue curve is Unreal, and this is showing wall clock time of 24 hours. So this is like, you set your experiment off and you come back a day later, and what happens? Well, A3C is just about taking off, and Unreal has already reached human performance. Um, so that's pretty cool. And if we zoom in on this curve, so now we're looking at a, a period of eight hours of training. So this is like you set your experiment off when you go to bed and you wake up in the morning, you check your curves, and A2C does absolutely nothing, and Unreal is starting to learn. Um, but as I said, we're, we're doing asynchronous reinforcement learning, and we've got, here we're using 32 workers. And what we can just do if, we, if we're really um, desperate to get results out in time, is to just add more workers. And so this is what happens if we add four times more workers. This means that overnight we can get superhuman results. Um, so we're down from like 15 hours to human performance on this level to about five or six hours. And um, you can just keep adding workers. So this is adding four times more workers. So now we're at 512 workers. And although it doesn't scale linearly, it scales really, really well. Um, and 
in two hours you can get human performance. So um, this is sort of a, a, I don't know, a game changer in terms of how you can iterate on experiments, and this is all made possible by the magic of distributed TensorFlow. Um, and you can do the same thing on Atari, and here I'm showing the results that you get after a single hour of training. So, um, yeah, one hour of training, how well can you do? Um, here, this, this, this dotted line is comparing against this evolution strategies method of reinforcement learning, um, which is another highly parallelizable method. And you can see that in general we do the same, if not better, um, than evolution strategies uh, across all the games. And what's really interesting is that if you just continue to let this run, this is one hour of performance, but if you continue to let this run for another few hours, you'll actually get state-of-the-art performance. Um, so these methods scale really, really well. And yeah, that's about it. Um, here in this work, the idea is to add these unsupervised auxiliary um, tasks, and this drastically improves RL training. Um, these tasks were pixel control, the wall prediction, and value function replay. And all of these improve the speed of convergence, um, make the method much more robust to hyperparameters, and um, all of that results in better performance. Um, so this is really uh, our state-of-the-art algorithm. Um, and another thing I really wanted to get across at the end was that RL scales really, really well with um, CPUs. So, you know, if you just want results out um, really quickly, which for certain applications, you don't care about being hugely data efficient in terms of steps of, for example, a simulated environment. You can have a setup where you have a simulated uh, environment which you're trying to train something on, and then you're going to, at the same time, be training in uh, a real robot in the real world. So you might want to be really data efficient in the real world. You don't care about data efficiency in the simulated environment, you just want to get results out as quickly as possible in the simulated environment. And so in this case, we can just add more CPUs and get huge increases in speed of training. Um, yeah, that's about it. Cool. Are there questions? So you were playing against the autoencoder, um, and that was yeah. autoencoding a single frame at a time. So I was just wondering, I mean, the thing that you're developing does kind of sound like maybe like a, a, a sort of related to the deep comp filter or something where, you know, we don't have autoencoder through time, but actually it's mm. sort of autoencoding an entire time series. I was just wondering, like, could you maybe comment on the difference between this approach and something like one of these like deep comp filter things? Um. I, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a huge space in between doing PIX control and input reconstruction that you can kind of go with. I think the input change prediction is getting quite close to these, like, common filters because you're, you really are doing, like, discounted... You, you, you learn, instead of the, training these Q functions, you're training value functions, so you're just not having the effect of actions, um, but you're still <laughs> taking into account the whole time series and trying to predict the future cumulative... Um, you know, change in intensity. Um, but yeah, I think this is just sort of scratching the surface of the types of auxiliary unsupervised prediction tasks and control tasks that you could do on top of the agent for the inputs. Do you have any thoughts on how to come up with these auxiliary control tasks? I mean, in a way, you um, it's a very generically applicable thing that you do, mm. but it inserts prior knowledge about the domain just yeah. quite quick. Um, but is it more systematic into which you can provide how to come up with additional auxiliary control tasks? Yeah, I think we don't have any systematic way uh, other than thinking about you know what are the, what are really the things that we need to learn about in the environment. Um, you know, reward the effect of your actions. Um, there are other things that have been tried, such as like that we tried like. Um, you know, trying to predict um, where in time in a sequence you are, so understanding temporal ordering of events, um, and more explicitly sort of doing inverse dynamics of, okay, here's a sequence of experience, what were the actions that led to that sequence of experience? Um, some of that worked, some of it didn't. 
yeah, there's no real systematic way uh, at the moment. So, um, so market has learning this type of ideas has been around for a long time. And one of the sort of one of the bigger explanations is uh, how to recognize. Is there any, is such a story in there? I mean, I, I, I and, as in this would have a recognizing effect. Yeah. Or? I don't, I, no, no I don't, obvious to see what we're fitting. Yeah, I mean, RL well, is one of these glorious domains where often, like, in these sort of tasks, you don't really care about overfitting. In fact, you want to overfit. Yeah, so. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really sure about the regularization that it's doing anything there. Um, I think it's mainly in terms of creating good features very on, early on in training, so that when you do get these rewards, you've got good features and easy ways to bind these policies to those features. So I, I had a question about the, the multiple workers. So it's uh, done asynchronously. Yeah. Right? So so basically, if you have a run that finishes quickly, then it will update more frequently. Yeah. yeah. Is that is that somehow changing the overall expectation of your updates? Um, um, is that are there some tricks that you need to do to, to kind of balance that the you know, shorter runs aren't having a disproportionate effect or something? So, I mean, in general, they're all trained, like all of the asynchronous workers are trained with the same number of, you know, you, you, you always do 20 step unrolls or whatever your number of unrolls is. Oh. Uh, yes, you might terminate an episode early. So, you, a particular worker at some point in time might have a shorter run, but in practice, it doesn't really um, change much. I think the only real trick um, to this is to do shared RMS prop. So, you're doing RMS prop, but the momentum and second order statistics are. Um, shared amongst all of your asynchronous workers. That's that's one stabilizing trick. Yeah. So um, an another phenomenon I think you have to observe from my past learning you get that negative transfer or negative effect. Yeah. Do you think that's gonna happen here? I mean that's what we saw with the input reconstruction that later on in training it actually harmed the policy. Um, yeah, I mean that's what happens when you come up with a bad auxiliary task I guess. Um, but technically speaking, you, sh you shouldn't, right? I mean, you, you, shouldn't have, you shouldn't get worse, except you can you have a way of uh, throw away that. You have a way of uh, sort of uh, saying, uh, just discount the contribution of the sign. You are manually looping the task that's relevant. Because potentially, yeah. I mean, just, this is a follow-up uh, special question. There's no obvious way to um, sort of constructing a set of very relevant tasks. Mm. Now the question is, if I if I think of we automatically creating this task, some of the relevant, some of the negative that I want to discuss. Yeah, I think that'd be a cool thing to try. Just like um, be able to define some arbitrary task space and try out thousands of different tasks and do automatic selection of auxiliary tasks, but something we haven't tried. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I was wondering for the auxiliary tasks. I can sort of see that initially, if your reward signals are very weak and you basically don't really know what you're doing, you should you should, take it, you should at least figure out something about what's yeah. happening in the environment, right? But I wonder whether you should actually also take actions according to those. Right? At the moment, you're just training yeah. them, and you're just sort of saying, "Well, I always I always refer back to the original task to take actions," but maybe that's not. Maybe that's not a good choice. Like maybe yeah. we should actually pursue them more heavily. I think it'd be really cool to. I mean, we, we have tried to use these like 400 ex, extra policies um, to help do exploration in some way. So you could think about, oh, I'm just going to try and maximise my top left uh, policy or my middle policy. Um, we haven't actually found any gain yet, but when you go more to sort of feature control where these features might correspond to something really interesting in the environment. I don't know, this feels like a really promising direction. We just haven't worked out how to do that or haven't seen things yet. But I agree with you there. Yeah.